Hi, everybody. My name is Tim Riley from Property Collectives. Thanks for joining us. We've got a, a special guest appearance all the way from the UK tonight, Francis Wright, to talk about Marmalade Lane and, and, and also to talk about, I think, community-led projects generally in the UK and, and, and sort of what's happening there. Um, but before we get into that and... Um, I introduced the panel. I thought I would just uh, do a quick acknowledgement of country. We're, we're here, uh, we're based in the lands of the, the Kulin Nations um, and acknowledge that the land that we live and work on were never ceded. Um, for the panel today, I'll, I'll leave Francis to the last, <laughs> maybe for the intros. Um, but um, yeah. My name's Tim. Tim Richardson's here, my business partner as well, and we're from Property Collectives. Um, maybe just a bit of context on why we put this um, event on. Um, we've obviously been involved with citizen-led or community-led development now since 2010, so we're interested in how to do things differently. Um, and uh, over the last few years, we've slowly been um, expanding, I suppose, the approach with building groups to do slightly larger projects and enable slightly larger communities. Um, the biggest one, which um, we're doing at the moment, is in Eltham. It's the Brown Street co-housing project, and there's a number of Brown Street members on the call tonight. Um, so part of that, I suppose, exploration from our perspective has, has got me interested in how, how these things are done overseas. You know, there's a much... Um, more established um, history of doing community-led development um, throughout Europe in particular and, and North America. Um, and uh, last year I went uh, to England with my family to visit my family and, and, and went up to Cambridge to check out Marmalade Lane and Francis was our generous host for the night. We stayed, stayed overnight in the guest rooms there and got to catch up with, with Francis and find out a bit more about Marmalade Lane and, and what it was all about. Um, and it was a fantastic visit. It was only one night, but um, my head was spinning a little bit with some of the stories that Francis was telling me about how the project was conceived and, and, and how... Um, it was enabled by the, the local authority. And I just thought, um, you know, it's probably nearly a year on since that visit to, to, um, to Marmalade Lane, but it's worth um, hosting this session and, and, and giving Francis an opportunity to tell the story of Marmalade Lane and what's going on in the UK, because there's lots of parallels, obviously, with an Australian context, but it does feel like we're a little bit behind. So, um, you know, Marmalade Lane is a good case study for us to potentially sort of aspire to. Um, so I might throw to, we've got a bit of a panel here today and the panel really is to try and um, get a bit of engagement on the way through. Um, we do want to make it a bit of an interactive session. So, you know, if you do have questions that pop up, please put them in the chat. The, the panel here are all co-housing enthusiast or practitioner or residents. Um, and I just thought it's good to have sort of like a smaller group um, to be maybe a bit more involved as, as Frances goes through her presentation. So um, firstly, Elena, do you want to just introduce yourself, give, give yourself a quick intro? Yeah, hello, I'm Elena Pereira. Sorry, I'll probably be not so active on the panel since I have COVID at the moment and feeling extremely tired. But I've been the chair of Co-Housing Australia for quite a few years, been on the board, and uh, my background's in architecture. So I'm very interested in sort of the built environment and how that interacts with um, social spatial design and community building and have experience in placemaking and, um, and participatory democracy and governance. So the full spectrum of things that co-housing projects tend to uh, champion, including uh, active transport and, and uh, yeah, people using bikes and uh, things like that to get around. So I'm a total co-housing nerd. Good person to have on the panel. Um, 
maybe then uh, Teresa, did you want to just give a quick intro? Yeah, so I'm also on the co-housing board, but I convene the planning policy uh, group because I have a planning background in local government. Uh, so my focus is how, how can you make the planning controls work for you? Because most of the time they work against the concept of co-housing. Um, I'm also a joint venturer um, on the Broom Street, which is the latest of things. So we've just gone to a very uh, interesting VCAT and come out with a very glowing, um, wonderful permit that wasn't just overturning council refusal, but has got some lovely accolades to us um, and the concept of co-housing. So that's very useful and happy to share the uh, planning the VCAT decision in the chat later because some of you might like to read it because it's got some really good quotes in it. Cool. Thank you, Teresa. And finally, Fern Robert, Robert, do you want to just give a quick intro? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm a member of uh, a joint venture of Broom Street as well. Um, so we're very excited that we got our VCAT um, um, approval and we intend hopefully moving in kind of the year off the next, starting to build uh, early next year. Um, so yes, I'm interested in, you know, all things co-housing. And I also, with my wife, visited Marmalade Lane roughly a year ago and we spent the night and uh, Francis took us around and we met some residents. So um, yeah, I saw what it's like and it's very exciting. There's some great initiatives there that we'd like to introduce to Broom Street. And uh, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Dan. All right, and lastly but not least, Francis, do you want to maybe just give a quick intro on yourself? Yeah. So, um, as you will have gathered, I live in Marmalade Lane and was very much involved as a future resident, joined the co housing group and got involved in the co-design process with an enabling developer. So I now work for that enabling developer town and I'm also a director of the UK co-housing network so I have those kind of three hats on as we um, go into the presentation so I hope that helps. Cool. All right thank you. Um, now just before we get into it um, I think everybody's on mute I think the zoom protocol is pretty well <laughs> now but yeah again if you do have some questions please pop them into the chat um, we've got, I sort of, sort of said it was a 90 minute session. Um, it'd be good if we can use that time. Um, I think Francis' presentation will probably go for about 30, 40 minutes. Um, and then, you know, we should have a good 30, 40 minutes. This meeting is being recorded. For, uh, for questions as well. So look, I'll just bring up uh, Francis' uh, presentation. And um, we'll get into it. Maybe everyone just double check that you're on mute. Thank you. Right. Can everybody see see that now? Right. Oh, Thank you, you, Tim. Yeah. Go for it. Um, well, let me start with um, just telling you what I'm going to cover. So just to manage your expectations, really. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit about Town, who was the enabling developer for Marmalade Lane. And then I'm going to um, talk a bit about what co-housing is and kind of cover that um, the sort of UK context for co-housing and then move into Marmalade Lane, tell you um, about how Marmalade Lane came about and then really move on to a perspective from um of towns about uh, how we think co-housing might develop in the uk and the kind of different models that we're playing around with at the moment and where we see the opportunities lie so that's that's the sort of journey of my presentation and i think i've got about 20 slides to go through so it's not um not packed and we've got plenty of time for questions and discussion uh, so you saw in the previous slide a little bit about what town is, and it's actually a tiny developer, um, probably about 13 people, um, very much um, multidisciplinary. And at the time of um, Marmalade Lane going out to tender, 
Um, there were actually just the founding directors and it was three months old. So just to give you a sort of sense of context and scale. And I'll, I'll come back to that point. And actually town works uh, kind of across uh, the scale of development really uh, gets involved in master planning larger districts and we're doing one at the moment with 5,600 homes in a sort of multi-use uh, context so uh, strategic development sites through to sort of medium-sized developments um, of neighborhoods and and block scale marmalade lane being the the best example so we work across those three different scales and they might see them as sort of um, mutually supporting each other in terms of learning that we have from Mumlet Lane, we can take into those different contexts and vice versa. So let's move on from there. That's my um, introduction to town. And just to say a little bit more, those slides have gone slightly wrong. Um, we, we've kind of distilled out four themes that are very common to all the things that we are involved in. And one is the sort of people-centered design and communities. The other is about design choice and trying to maximize that for um, potential residents, playing and food growing nature and um, low energy buildings. So they all come together for us. And um, all of the images here are from Marmalade Lane because that's probably a really good example, but we're trying to use those things at scale as well. Right, on to next one. So I'm moving on now to just talk in general terms about co-housing. And um, in the and I don't know how the definitions differ between uh, different countries around the world, but uh, our definition that we use within the UK co-housing network uh, are these uh, five principles. And, um, but actually the sort of uh, lead in uh, context is really important too. And I suppose over time, I've realized that actually that is probably the key thing to emphasize. So I would emphasize that it's an intentional community. And what I mean by that is that everyone involved in both um, kind of the creation of that community and those people who move in and those people who move into the future, the, the ambition is that everyone's holding a shared intention to create a community and and what comes with that and so but the the principles in more detail are that they're blending private homes with shared spaces and there are some exceptions around that private home because you sometimes see um shared living homes in as part of co-housing in the uk or that where there's been conversions of bigger buildings you sometimes get a more um blended approach but the principle is that you're blending private homes um with greater shared spaces than that, that both inside and outside than than are normal and the shared space is in the internal space is typically called the common house in a co-housing context and the design principles in forming co-housing is really focused on encouraging social interaction both the sort of intentional social interaction because it's an intentional community but also the the unintended the incidental social interaction that you have through moving around the site and so that's really informing the design principles very strongly for co-housing obviously within the context of the site constraints and so on and then the other aspect is that it's co-designed with residents they're part of the journey and i think beyond that actually that often it it uh, residents are actually the developers um and in the context that i'm going to be talking about where there is an enabling developer that the residents were involved in far more than just the design. They were very involved in the, the sort of legal framework that was going to operate once the site was handed over to the community. And they were also intensely involved in the sales, the marketing process. They really owned that process. So the principle is that, is that it's co-designed with residents, but actually the, the opportunity go and the in practice, it goes beyond that. And at the end of that journey, it, um, residents go on to collectively manage their own community. So it's uh, you end up with a resident management company, but but with this sort of co-housing context around it. And then finally, and it's one that I think we've added in the UK to try and address the tendency of co-housing being or perceived to be very inward looking. And so the principle that we now emphasize that it's a, it's 
they're typically a good neighbor to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so that's that's our five principles in in the UK. Um, and before I move on, I would be interested just to hear whether they are similar to the principles that you have in Australia for how you define co-housing. Maybe Elena or Teresa, do you want to comment on that? Um, I'm really interested in the last one. Yes. Um, because here, uh, especially in urban context, it's often the neighbours that have all sorts of misconceptions and, and um, put in objection. So yes. yeah, um, it'd be interesting, are you very proactive in trying to um, demonstrate that they're going to be good neighbours? I mean, we've done a lot by inviting them to information sessions and, you know, say, come and see the people. We're not, you know, we're it's normal people. We're not... Um, weird um, but yeah do you do anything um, and does the council when you get involved um, actually start supporting the idea that this type is actually good at a neighbourhood and district level because no, yeah. it's not something here that we really have pushed because yeah. in fact we've so, probably had the opposite yeah, yeah no, um, well I think as I was introducing these principles I was saying we've sort of added this principle partly to reflect our experience of what happens in practice anyway, but partly to to just help everybody reposition their thinking about co-housing and that the importance of being a good neighbour, not only to each other in the community context, but the wider, wider neighbourhood. And um, so that does flow out into obviously trying to engage with your lo lo uh, local community through the planning process. You would be doing that anyway. I... I I'm slightly torn here because um, most of the new build co-housing communities here in the UK do do some, they have some aspect they do with their local neighborhood. Um, and one of them has, a, uh, sometimes they have legacy kind of buildings that are perhaps repurposed to have, um, a, one, one owns a mill for instance, and runs that as a sort of community center uh, properly and commercially. Some, one has a little tiny wood, uh, that they open as a public park. Um, and I suppose it's slightly nuanced because here at Marmalade Lane, uh, we're quite near a local community centre and their anxiety was that we would compete with them and their booking. So we have quite um, restrictions on what we can do, um, but it doesn't stop us inviting our neighbours to um, pizza parties every year or going out with some of our resources. I think we took our all our sofas to a local park and hosted tea and coffee and cakes um, one summer. So doing that sort of interaction, I think there is some fear sometimes, uh, particularly that sort of, will, will these venues compete? Um, and yet it happens anyway. I My hesitation is around, um, certainly here at Marmalade Lane, we didn't really think it through about uh, in our design principles as to how to design for social interaction in the community context, but also design for being able to invite the general public to our, into our community. We didn't really think that through. Um, and the other sort of nuance I suppose I'd want to reflect on is for various weird reasons around UK planning law, we ended up with a three-year commitment to do some public art. Um, and it was very widely drawn and it included some educational activities and it included um, sort of events open to the public. And what we found was, of course, that enshrining something into a legal agreement as to what we would do for all these prospective residents two years in advance meant that that isn't what we did. <laughs> um, it was very, um, it sort of informed what we did, but actually we did something, a collection of things that were entirely different based around the needs and interests of the residents and the resources that we had. So tying, sometimes tying those things into the planning process and committing people in advance to do certain things but, you know, it seems quite challenging um, but it is something that we increasingly from a sort of town developer perspective are thinking about how can you how can you be more explicit um, about that offer if you like and that commitment 
along the journey. So we'll come back to that. I would yeah. just add in the Australian context, for example, Murundaka, which Lucy has commented on in the chat as well, uh, is in the municipality of Banyul, and they created within their planning scheme uh, dispensation for developer contributions out of recognition for the kind of public benefit that that community did contribute to its neighbourhood. So I think that there is a really exciting opportunity for there to be partnership between the council and the co-housing community in order to do an assessment of the assets that are existing and the things that are kind of missing and the places where the co-housing group could potentially uh, assist and, and participate in, in placemaking and, and other initiatives. I would say there's also a kind of barrier here around the very transactional nature of housing and just the lack of assistance um, through the planning process that exists and the very expensive cost of housing that communities can be quite exhausted by the time they move in, which I think makes them potentially a little bit kind of more backward in coming forward because they just are lacking some capacity. So it would be nice to have more of a balance there so that these can be really positive projects going forward. From a design perspective, though, I would say overwhelmingly communities want to be a good neighbour and contribute positively to the neighbourhood character. No one wants to move in and be the people with the obnoxious building. So there's a good relationship within co-housing communities, but also to adjacent precincts. Can I just say something too? Sorry, I'm, I'm on my phone now. Can everyone hear me? Yep, yep. Yeah, I was just going to um, just add around the, you know, the communal facilities and the ability to engage further with the public on the Brougham Street one, trying to work through, you know, what one of the communal spaces would be, which was an existing building. Where there was so much back and forth with council and anxiety about what uses might occur in that space, which was a communal space. And there actually would be opportunity um, maybe for some sort of, you know, public involvement or holding some sort of events there that could, you know, integrate that site better with the community, but it would just be so challenging to get the council's head around that um, and how that fits into strict planning provisions in Victoria, even just having it as a communal space where people might be able to come and meet um, was an issue about that being another residence and, and things like that. So there's certainly a lot um, that can be worked through about one, bringing the community around the development, but also just the communal facilities themselves and what you can do in those spaces under the planning um, provisions. Brilliant, Thanks. thank you. So just to sort of pick up the journey and the context for the UK, you can see at the bottom on my slide that we've only got 11 new build co-housing communities in 20 years. So um, we're not a great example of making um, progress in terms of um, co-housing. And, and I'm not sure that we've got the methodology right and that's really partly the context that I, uh, this presentation is going to be about so there's 300 homes there are actually probably a, um, a greater number it's always hard to actually nail the number but I think probably around 15 um, co-housing communities which are conversions of existing buildings or a blend of new build and existing buildings um, and I don't know the number of homes in relation to that so it gives you an idea of scale um, and the time frame in which this has been happening. So if we go on to the next slide, um, and I'm not really going to dwell on this, but it's sort of in terms of what co-housing offers, um, we've, I think co-housing is um, exhaustively researched, so I'm drawing on some of that research um, in terms of listing the benefits here. Um, and... And the primary one is this neighbourliness and the sense of belonging and sort of a counteraction to loneliness that so often can be sort of endemic in our housing context now um, and our lives. Um, that's really the one that co-housing addresses really well. The, the sort of um, it's designed for being a more sociable place to live and it and it does it. Uh, but there are all, all these additional benefits. The 
Um, the convenience one is amusing me at the moment because um, in placemaking terms, we often talk about 15 minute cities and five minute neighborhoods. And I've concluded I live in a one minute um, neighborhood um, because everything is really available my, for my day to day needs. It's available on the site. We now have our own internal shop, a small gym. Uh, since Tim and Turn visited, we've now got a, a, a little sauna which I came from this morning. Um, you know, I, my social life is here. I can get my takeaways here. So there really isn't any need to leave the site. Um, I also work from home. So I, as a result of all of this, I decided to, to get a dog. So there's a dog in the background who might bark from time to time. But that was my, how do I leave my one a minute neighborhood? I'm going to have to get a dog. That will make me leave. Um, so it's incredibly convenient because what it enables is people to solve their own problems. A lot of those things were not in our plans before we moved in. Um, they've come since as people have kind of identified their needs collectively and sought to respond to them. So it's a very um, creative, but also quite a resilient process. And a lot, quite a lot of these changes happened during COVID. Um, the shop, for instance, was an addition during COVID and that has been very successful and stayed. Hey, um, just just a couple of questions while we're on this slide. So, I mean, Marmalade Lane is pictured on the left. That's sort of an aerial. Um, and, I mean, interesting to hear your comments then about the fact that you don't need to leave. I think uh, one of the things that we're working through in an Australian context is is scale of a of a of a community. And I mean, Marmalade Lane I think is forty two homes. Yeah. 42 homes so yes. it's a mix of and i might just draw we've got the the common house is sort of here in yes, the center. Great. um i think right now francis is somewhere in here uh, yep. which is the apartment building and then maybe down here is is that another apartment building in there or is that yeah so there are apartments along those three terraces there are like um what we would kind of sometimes call Tyneside Flats or Maisonettes as well yeah. in the terrace, but that one is an apartment block. And at the bottom is the gym and the workshop. Yes, down here. And then mm. there's some community growing area uh, just in front of that block. You can see there. So that is cre creating food for the common house meals. Um, and actually the, the bank of trees, which you can probably just see out of my balcony window, um, is quite significant here. I mean, it's obviously connecting with nature, but that is quite an the remnants of an ancient um, boundary line marked with trees that in the master plan for the wider area. So we're in Orchard Park and it's a thousand homes, some a small, very tiny, small shopping centre, largely unsuccessful and a community centre. So a new urban fringe development yeah, Mark Lane is sitting in that context. And actually, if you compare our site to the neighbouring site, which is a similar size in terms of um, the dimensions of the site and the number of units, had we followed that master plan, that bank of trees would have disappeared. And it would have disappeared as a result of the need to put cars yeah. nearer houses and yeah. to give the houses their own back gardens and it's sort of when you do a compare and contrast and you can do it on google um, maps you can really see what we gained by using different design principles here's my dog arriving <laughs> um so yes. and i think i think you i mean the car park is is over here and i think it's a really elegant response to basically just get all the cars to the periphery of the site and then free up the balance of the site um, Although, again, in planning terms, the planners were, um, they were supportive, but also concerned about the car parking ratio. So technically, in planning terms, there are car parking spaces in the lane that the group never intended to use and hasn't. Um, and there are car parking spaces, you can just about see it below that bank of trees to the right of the, um, a lot, the growing area. There's a sort of what looks like dirt that actually technically is car park. Um, it now actually has a trampoline and a slide and climbing <laughs> frame. It's not mm -hmm. used, but actually there's 11 car parking spaces in our rear garden um, that where we've managed to reduce our car ownership enough through the use of a community car club to not utilize those spaces. Oh, that's great. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is, I mean, the balance of the dwellings are townhouses, um, mm. but there are a couple of really cool little... Yes, um, that's what I was what talking about, calling Tyneside yeah, yeah, yeah. Pats or Maisonettes, yeah. yes. So they're sort of within a townhouse form, you've got two separate tenancies with a small sort of apartment on the ground and then a, 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 another small apartment on the first floor. Yeah, they're actually quite large. Once converted, they're over 100 square metres, that, okay. that first floor. Once it's converted into a loft, so on the first floor, it's probably two-bedroom apartment, but then it, once it's converted, it's really quite a significant home yeah. and it has a balcony and then stairs down to the sort of garden. So... Um, and that enables the community to have, I think one of the things the community wanted was to be multi-generational, but not have all the people in small, small accommodation in one location and yeah. a bigger accommodation elsewhere. So it's very blended. And so on the, each terrace, you can go from one bed to five bed really quite easily. Yeah. Um, and that works well. Cool. And then we've got some apartments and I'm in that apartment block that have um, lift access. So they're much thinking about um the longer term Injury, aging in place yeah yeah so, so just, just yeah. About it, do you, how big is the property and what sort of site coverage uh, have so you this got is one before? one hectare just under one hectare and there's 42 homes of which half are houses and half are apartments and so actually this is quite a big community not just in terms of the number of units um so I slipped into developer speak there um but also in terms of the number of people. So we've got approximately 65 adults here and 35 children. So we're we're at the top end, I think, of, of what really works in a co-housing context. Right. And you don't know how much, um, what the percentage of built form covering the, the site is, do you, offhand? No, no, mm -hmm. I don't. Yeah. In Broom Street, we're covering... Well, if we include, we've got like a flood zone at the bottom of our site, which is you know, open space. We're covering 22% of our site with built form. So yeah. we've got significant open space. And I mean, you have yeah. two, really, which is great. I mean, that's one of the big benefits, You're keeping the car park up the front and then having a lot of open space. Yeah. I mean, so where the car park um, is located was a real um, issue in planning um, because the rest of the site is designed to have active frontages. So having a car park at the front for us was um, not going to happen. <laughs> but actually it now adjoins a, a, another car park for a neighbouring plot, which which works quite well. Um, so, and, was, uh, and was this actually a, a car thoroughfare, this street originally? Yes. Was, so, yeah. but, uh, no, it wasn't originally. This was actually a field. So but that oh, lane... In the that lane. Yeah. has yeah no it has six car parking spaces in planning terms the group never intended it to be used like that and it's not been adopted so the it's a it's a private road there is we um in planning terms have to permit access so um access is permitted but it's pedestrian and cycling access only so yeah, so for all of the planners on this call i think <laughs> i could say one thing being flexible around car parking with these sorts of projects unlocks yeah lock, unlocks it much. unlocks it unlocks so much livability and um it's just critical i think for enabling these more community focused developments i think um yeah but certainly in the UK, in the planning context, one of my having now working for developers, I know that in the UK, at least planning is all about cars, the movement of cars and the movement of bin lorries yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in particular. And those things, uh, you know, kind of need to be solved in a co-housing context because they can really, if you follow the sort of conventions, it can really undermine what you're trying to do in design terms. Um, and here, uh, very unusually, for this, for the wider development, we have collective um, bin stores with giant bins, and we are responsible for taking those bins out to the um, pavement, the highway. Yeah. And we have a rotor to do that. Um, so yeah. let's move yeah. on. Francis, just quickly in the chat, okay. somebody asked about shared cars. I know you've got a, a few shared cars. Yeah, we do. Um, you just want to touch on that because we, we're very interested in doing a similar thing in Bourne Street. Yes, so we have we always intended to have a car club, a community car club. 
we looked at using sort of the ordinary commercial type ones that run in the UK and it just didn't work. We realized it didn't work um, for the context that we wanted, which was to enable people to kind of use a car club as if it was their own car. So to use it with the same level of frequency they ordinarily would. And that didn't really work financially for anybody with the commercial one. So we set up our own club. We have our own financial model around it. It's um, we now have four cars in it um, and 16 households are a member of it. And half of those households have no car, private car now. The others, because they're only have, able to have one car on this site, use it as, uh, for a second car. Um, but of those eight that have no car, probably half didn't have a car when they moved in and half have consciously given up a car to be part of that club um and so it's worked really well we really really struggle with car insurance um doing anything different in the world of insurance is a, is a challenge um well I, I won't bore you about that but it, it has that aspect has been challenging thank you so this is just that broader context about why choosing co-housing i am not going to take you through it in detail but i think co-housing um, really isn't for everyone, um, it's, but it is for quite a lot of people and lots of people don't know about it. And when they do, they actually think, ah, this just makes sense, doesn't it? Um, so there are all sorts of things that come really from knowing your neighbours and having shared resources. And um, and so that sort of brings fun and interest. It's very rewarding. It's also very practical, as I've pointed to. Um, uh, so there's lots of really good things about co-housing, um, but it's also tough. You know, making decisions together is sometimes really difficult and um, and you're giving up a bit of autonomy to enter into those processes to collectively and live with those outcomes. And so it's not without its challenges. So it really needs people. And this is the sort of context that I was emphasizing around intentionality. Um, it works well when people really want to be part of co-housing and are kind of committing to making it work. And that helps on the times that it's a bit more difficult. Um, and, um, but it's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I hope that gives a little bit of insight into why, why co-housing makes sense for us. It was really driven about, I had always, when I, when I first heard about co-housing, it was with the first one in the UK 20 years ago. And I thought, wow, it's an amazing place to bring up children. I've got three children. Wouldn't that be amazing? And it took me until they left home for us to actually move into co-housing um, because it's so rare. <laughs> and trying to coordinate your life with the rare opportunities has been like, it just didn't happen. Um, so now we're here as two adults and it's, um, yeah, very rich, very rewarding, um, not without its difficulties. And, um, but I can't imagine living anywhere else really. And it just makes so much sense in a sort of sustainability. And increasingly, I think it's going to make sense in terms of um, resilience in the times that we're entering into. So move on. So um, I, you probably have a, something similar, but this is uh, the route map from the UK co-housing network about how you go from, ah, amazing, co-housing. I've never heard of that before, but it sounds amazing. How do you go from that to actually living in a community? And you can see this sort of um, journey with various loops and uh, and yeah, 17 stages and obviously, um, uh, kind of 11 groups in the UK over 20 years have got to the end of that journey. <laughs> so, and the biggest one in the UK is actually access, access to land is the biggest problem, getting that land opportunity. Um, starting up a group is fine. We have, you know, 65 groups and they're constantly, um, Ones the new ones are starting and old ones are kind of going on pause because they haven't got anywhere. So it's the it's the access to land that's really problematic. Um, not to say that finding finance and all the development side isn't difficult, but land is the prime primary challenge. So we'll come back to that theme. Um, I'm going to just pause there and just see if there's any more questions before I. This is really the start of a marmalade lane conversation, which is actually going to be a conversation that bleeds through the whole presentation, obviously, given I live there. Um, but any other questions on the sort of generality? 
No, excellent. Right. So this is Marmalade Lane, seeing it from a different image. Um, and um, this is the con journey that I want to tell you about, about. So let's move on to the next slide. And we've touched on many of uh, these aspects. So I'm not going to repeat it. But the key thing is it's now five years old. Um, and it was completed around 2018, 2019. And um, the... The developer got involved in 2015. So actually in development terms, it was a, a really sort of happened in a normal development um, timescale. But we'll come back to the real journey. Um, and it did enable really close collaboration with future residents. So although the residents were not the developer, which was uh, different to all of the other co-housing communities in the UK till that point, um, the residents were heavily involved, not just in the design, but at sales, legals, all of those kind of things. And they did have customization choices that were developed with the developer and they were able to choose from. And the homes are environmentally um, pretty good for their time. And we've looked at the layout in terms of the neighborly design. So, And it's won many, many awards and it has many, many visitors. And sometimes that feels a bit surreal because it, it also feels very ordinary, <laughs> you know, it is houses and gardens and parking places. It's just um, the sort of it, the design intent line behind it, I think, sort of makes it. But in the UK, what is really significant is that this site was a land first, group next and developer led. That hadn't happened in the UK. And um, actually, when I looked at it, I thought, actually, we were living in the west side of England and we moved. We sold our house when we first hold, so heard about it and moved because we could see that this model was actually going to mean that this co-housing community was going to happen. Mm. Really significant shift and um, and a really good model that we're now be beginning to try and um, play with and see where we can take it to, because it... It has the ability to unlock co-housing a bit more. Um, so, and I've said, in the, the when we looked back at the journey that we've just seen, the tradition in the UK is group first, then find the land, then the group is the developer. And it normally doesn't get beyond the, the forming the group. Yeah, which is, which is, I mean, that's the model that we've been mm. with property clip is the building group model. Um, and I'm not aware of this approach, apart from maybe in Canberra. I think the ACT government are trying to do something like that in Canberra. But, um, Teresa, did you have a question? Um, I want to go back because you talked about, um, and I think it was in your four pillars right at the beginning, design choice and customization. And how do you balance that against, um, obviously, cost and affordability? Because... Um, sitting there, know that some of the German products they sort of are quite rigid. You know, you've got three choices, but you, you you sort of mentioned that as sort of being quite important. So, how did that process play out? Well, I think um, so. Some of the context is that on the journey, and I'm going to come to that journey. It started as sort of group custom build, so it was sort of always built in that customization was important. I don't think it's fundamental to co housing at all, um, but Nonetheless, we had options. The group worked with the developer to refine those options. So, for instance, in my apartment block, there were basically two layouts and they represented the two different views about whether or not a bathroom should have a window or not. Um, and so we had two outcomes. We had um, arranged th three options for kitchens, one of which was not to have a kitchen install, install, uh, installed at the time you moved in. It had to be building regulations so it did have a sink and a plug for a cooker but so we were quite the options included quite unusual options like not having a kitchen but they were quite you know they were limited and the group recognized that they knew that this was not like you were getting your perfect custom built home perfect for you it was going to be compromised along the way and we had to make sense of that okay i'm going to move to the next slide so this is how marmalade lane happened so it was a fortuitous accident, if you like, of the financial crash. Something good had to come out of that. The city council um, 
was actually the landowner of this site. But this this was actually not in its patch. It owned land just over its border. And it had, um, and it's part of this wider development. And it had, uh, the site was designated for all market sale. So there were no affordable homes to be on this site in the wider master plan. And they had a mainstream developer who'd, uh, was in the process of buying the site when the crash happened and they withdrew. They just didn't, uh, as did many developers at the time in, in this development. And so, um, so initially they thought, well, um, actually no mainstream development is going to happen for quite a long time. Let's try something different. They had been to Vauban in Germany and came back inspired about sort of group custom build and a bit later on in their sort of process of thinking about it, they they settled on co-housing for its added social value. One of the councillors knew about co-housing and advocated for it. And so the site gets designated for that. And they um, I think they got some grant funding from the government to look into the feasibility of pursuing that path um, and later agreed on it. And it was quite a slow process. This is a local authority. Um, and so this sort of happened <laughs> relatively slowly. And they got to the point where they, they were really clear about their objectives for going down this path. And one was that um, they, still, they still needed the land receipt. They still needed a good land receipt. They needed to go out to competitive tender to ensure they got that. They also... Um, because the wider community had experienced development grounding to a halt and sites partly developed all due to the financial crash, um, they really wanted the comfort of a developer being involved um, rather than it being led by a group. So they they kind of determined that. And um, they wanted to use uh, the site as an opportunity to really help raise standards locally in terms of the quality of the homes that were being built but also in terms of sustainability standards and, and in terms of community building. So they were deliberately using it as a site that would be an example in Cambridge and hopefully influence what happened in Cambridge elsewhere. So they had those objectives and, um, and their, their feasibility work involved them um, engaging someone to try and see if there was interest. And that led to the formation of what was called the K1 co-housing group. That was the name on the, the plot name in the master plan. And they formed and they there were sort of targets set to the group. So the group had to get so many members who paid so much amount of money at, at a certain stage. They then needed to set up legally. They needed to get a grant to do that. Um, and then they had to develop a client brief, which the council had to approve. So they spent some time and all of this took time accessing grant, uh, releasing it in phases. But they set up, they did a client brief that was something like 62 pages long, probably more detailed than now with my town hat, we would say is necessary. Detailed design brief. And the intention was that the group would then seek outline planning permission. And that was really coming from certainly a sort of group fear that the that developers wouldn't do uh wouldn't follow the client brief if there wasn't if it wasn't constrained by an outline planning commission that was very very detailed now the group didn't secure outline planning commission they could never agree with the planners where the cars went uh, that was really the kind of the fundamental challenge here and so it progressed to a land sale without that outline planning commission and that was a two stage tender. And the first stage was all about quality. And the second stage was a mixture of price and quality. And, um, and the group was involved in scoring. They scored alongside the council. The group also met all the um, uh, bidders as part of that process and was able to engage with them. And the outcome was that town which was only three months old as a tiny new developer, but was partnering with a, U a new UK subsidiary of a Swedish house builder, Trisselhurst, were selected. And they were selected in 2015. So there's fifth, five years journey here, which um, to get to that point, and I think there was an enormous amount of learning in that journey. So it's not that we're saying this is the right 
approach because I think you can probably make more sense of that and reduce that. But this is the model that was highly innovative at the time and started with that land first approach and brought in a developer and brought it in, in a context. So that was our journey. I'm going to take some questions, but I'm going to do the next, I think one or two slides first because then it will come together more. So from the purchaser's perspective, what was that like? Because it actually was very like an off-plan off purchase, a conventional off-plan purchase in many ways, but with all of this engagement going on. So um, the, the tender and the land contract was three parties. So the group was a party to that land sale contract. And actually, but all it it was in there for was to require the group to take the three hold the freehold at the end of the purchase for a pound or uh, the completion of the site for a pound. So that's it does that actually after the last home is sold. Um, and the land contract required the developer to engage uh, with the co-housing group through the development process and to um honor the client brief reflecting um and ref which had already been sort of reflected in the tender process and their designs had moved on through that tender process so it kind of tied them in in that way um but from an individual perspective uh it still looked very normal um in relation to the group uh, the individuals buying from the developer so, and it was all market sales. Um, the, later on, the numbers increased just a little bit. So it triggered an affordable home requirement. And, and I don't want to dwell on any of that because that's a very UK specific planning context, but they're all market sale. So the values needed to absorb the cost of building the common house. The common house was about a million pounds, um, about uh, including lots of circulation space, about 500 square meters. So conventional off-plan purchases, except that there were early exchanges. Some people could get uh, exchange early and get a small discount as a consequence. Um, and that just helped uh, with sort of giving everybody confidence to um, proceed with the construction contract and the finance related to that, that sort of early commitment. The members also were paying a membership fee. It was one off. Um, that's, I'm not sure that was the best, best model, but they had a membership fee and then they paid um, a commitment fee that in the end worked out at 2,100 per household. And that was designed um, so that as people got involved before the formal purchase process, they were making a financial commitment. Um, it didn't mean they couldn't be paid back, but it, it was said that it couldn't be paid back until after the completion of the site if they withdrew. And those fees were going to be used by the group for any kind of professional advice they needed along the way, but ultimately to furnish and equip the common house and the shared areas. So it, it was those commitment fees were playing many roles, but that was the end result of those fees. Um, and of course, the group is developing itself as part in parallel to the development of the site. But it's developing it itself as a sort of community and about how to make decisions and all of those kind of things. So I'm going to pause there because the rest are different examples. But um, questions about I, that laying yeah. process. Thank you, Francis. I've got a few questions. I might jump in first if that's all right. So just a, just a quick one um, on terminology. In a in an English context, what does custom build mean? Uh, good question. Um, well, we have self build and custom build. Um, so self build is a kind of individual buying a plot and building their own home, and custom build is more of um, um, developers offering greater levels of customization, um, and it's been exploited. So we we. Increasingly, strategic development sites have a percentage of the site that needs to be for self and custom build. Integrating self build into a much wider development context is a nightmare for health and safety and all sorts of practical things. So the focus becomes on custom build. And that's where 
um, mainstream developers are doing a sign of very light touch customization option and where co-housing I'm going to come back to this might be a sign of solution mm. as a, to address that sure and that, just another couple of questions um with the 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 process and and the way the council ran the process with the land settlement at what point did the land settle did the council leave the land in the deal for uh, quite a long time or did they did they make the developer purchase the land before the build Ah, uh, yeah. Um, no, they deferred quite a substantial part of the purchase price, yes. which was helpful, but Absolutely. it wasn't like a deal breaker. But it was really helpful that they did that. Yeah. And you, there was an. Do you remember yeah. at what point the settlement had to occur from them? Um, I think it actually happened in in. I mean, I, I could look that up. But I think it actually happened with each house sale, and then there was a long stock provision uh, mm -hmm. as well. And there was an overage clause. Yeah. Which is, I mean, you know, from a there from, was from a project perspective is is uh, very beneficial, I think, you know, for, yeah. for for these sorts of projects to have the land left in the deal for so long. Yeah. Um and the tender that council ran uh ran mm -hmm. was that that tender for a developer only or was it for a developer and a builder at the same time? It was for developer only um, for various technical reasons. It, it was still a land sale yep. uh, to avoid triggering other aspects. So it was kind of whilst there were clauses to to make it more like an enabling developer role and link in that sort of co-housing context, it was still a land sale. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, um, Tim in the uh, Tim in the chat has asked: Has the project helped act or showcase as the precedent for better design and sustainability, as envisaged? As the years yeah. have gone? Has it has it achieved those objectives? I think so. I mean, um, we have probably had thousands of visitors. Um, I think we appear in design codes all across the UK and many other countries. I think we just had the Japanese government ask if we could, they could use some images uh, as an example of a child-friendly neighborhood. So it's, it's, and and I think there's a circuit of residential developments that people come to Cambridge to see and we're one of them. So it's definitely helped raise um, people's thinking about what is possible with design. Um, it hasn't yet triggered more co-housing and we'll come, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, but I think from the council's perspective, they're very proud of it. I think they're five years on really realizing the value of what they've created. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely achieved their objectives. Can I just add on to that then? So, um, were there any other councils that then modeled that to, to, to go out and sell land in a similar way, or it really was just a moment in history? Um, not yet. And I think, um, I think that's partly just reflecting on that. I think that's partly because the affordability crisis has become so significant that, um, and the sort of crisis in local authority funding that council land is currently um, it's a finite resource after all, either being targeted on building social rents, so affordable homes, um, or depending on the political um, composition of the local authority, or being targeted purely for a land receipt. And, and whilst this generated a good land receipt, the competition effectively is slightly restricted in the context of co-housing. Um, so it, it hasn't been replicated in quite this way, but I'm going to come on to where I think the opportunities lie in the UK. I mean, that's an interesting point on the land receipt or the sale, the sale price. I mean, we would say sale, sale, sale price in Australia. I mean, It'd be interesting to understand, and it's a hard exercise, whether or not the price paid by 
town and cubicles it was commensurate to you know a normal kind of off the plan sales developer you know at, at a point in time because I, I would imagine for local councils that would be a big deal you know like yes there are these um intrinsic benefits with you know supporting a co-housing community and, and and delivering this sort of quality built form outcome but you know you would see more scale if councils were confident that enabling this sort of project could still <laughs> they could have the cake and eat it too you know you could still yeah, absolutely. Good, good... absolutely but i think i think the challenge is that if this if this site had just gone out without any constraints um and so therefore mainstream house builders would compete for it they would they would be offering a land receipt in the context of their cookie cutter model which generates you know 40 percent return for them but has no quality and um and and we this, the small innovative developers just can't compete with that so even when we're not doing co-housing our ability to compete with mainstream developers in a tender is really really low like we we need something tipped in our favor to enable us to compete and then that is about councils really specifying quality and standards into into mm. what they're doing if they're driven by needing to fill a hole in their budget and the land we see the sales price then those things often fall away yeah so Francis, you don't think the discussion is getting sophisticated enough to actually start talking about the health and well-being? There's a lot of work to cost health and well-being, and cost um, communities for social um, isolation. I, I, and I, I, so I am, I am painting in rather binary terms, but the, um, I think there is. It just it at the moment it hasn't delivered another marmalade lane. But I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Shall we move on? So I'm just going to talk you uh, through some other co-housing schemes that we're involved in or and where we see the opportunities. So this is an example in a small sort of railway town next to a much large, larger city of Milton Keynes. And this was a site that town had been parceling together long before town started, in fact. Um, um, uh, and it's a high street regeneration. And originally... The idea was all the homes would be built for rent and then there would be community facilities and shops and, and my boss likes tap rooms. So um, that kind of thing on this high street. And we but we had been separately working with a co-housing group, helping them bid for um, some land and they were unsuccessful like three times. So we then offered them one of the blocks. So one of the blocks will be an, for a senior co-housing group part of this wider development. And from a developer perspective, this actually makes really good sense um, uh, for us. You know, commercially it makes sense, um, reputationally it makes sense. Um, so the, doing Marmalade Lane has also given us confidence to do slightly different things as well in terms of our own development. And so this is an example of that really. Um, so if we move on, this is a, a different model, entirely and perhaps a more conventional model, one we're beginning, I think we're beginning to see a little bit of, which is where the group had got as far, they actually had bought some land. Um, someone had inherited some money and they bought two parcels of land um, from the local authority to put the land out to tender. Um, and they probably overpaid for the land, uh, had planning permission for something that with a bit of tweak could have been co-housing. Um, but it wasn't viable to build it. Um, and so it languished for a long time with the group trying to get it over the line, never succeeded in it. So the group had been had owned the land since 2015. And we've we got involved much later on and we've just secured planning permission with them. But we're acting as a development manager on this project. Um, and so we're paid a development manager fee. It's fixed. We've been doing a lot of work for free once that because it's all been delayed in planning um but we will also take a share of the um profit and there needs to be a profit even though it's group led because it needs to be able to secure development finance and to do that it needs to in its appraisal have that built in so that's um that's another context which i think we're seeing and therefore again in a convent in 
the group is acting as the developer, but they're selling it pretty much like an off-plan purchase. So people are still buying at market value and that value will include the common house and they're still paying a commitment fee, which is going to give the group resources in, a, in addition to their share of this um, profit to fit out the common house and probably set up a community car club as well. So that's that's a more conventional model. Um, if we go on now. Hey, um, Francis, just time checking. We've got about 20 more minutes. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah I'm going to speed speed up. So this is a just, um, this is another model entirely. So this is a, a, a market town, small field, full, space for 14 homes. We are taking a building group approach. So we're not saying this is co-housing, but we've assembled the future residents at the beginning of the journey. So we've gone out um, and recruited them using uh, good community engagement, word of mouth, Facebook advertising. So we have assembled probably three quarters of the future residents and we haven't yet got planning permission. Uh, so it's a different model um, that we're experimenting with, um, but it's still developer led and it's still the land, we're starting with the land, then we're there as a developer and then we're finding that group. So it's a different journey and we're very conscious that we have to kind of build a community as well. It, so it's not specifically going to be co-housing, but it is driven by thinking about sustainability. And so the group is beginning to think differently about their green homes in the context of building a more sustainable neighborhood and how more sustainable can you be if you, if you know your neighbors and can collaborate with them. So different language, different contexts, but us experimenting with um, finding our residents early on. And if you go to the next slide. Well, and, of... and it's a spectrum, isn't it, Francis? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we're just playing around with it. I think we found it, the conversations are different because it, when you say we're going to do a co-housing community, it's sort of almost given what the principles are. So it's been a, um, a different type of journey. Um, and, and I also think that co-housing has... Some people don't, it doesn't resonate with some people as a no, it doesn't. And I mean, this is, um, and this is a lot of bungalows. So this is a slightly older generation and they're sort of, they they initially was like Marmalade Lane, oh, that's not for us, but they visited Marmalade Lane and they're beginning to think differently about their, their neighborhood and what they might do with it. And we've built into the appraisal, I think it's only 40 square meters of a communal facility for them to think about what they might do with that. And we've also built in commitment fees so that, they will have some money, not a huge amount, but some money, maybe about probably about 28,000 at the end of the journey for their resident management company. They can decide what to do with it. So um, sort of mimicking some of the thing, aspects of co-housing in this journey. If we carry on um, beyond this slide, um, this is just really capture what but the benefits for the res future residents, but also the benefits for us as a developer, because it obviously reduces speculation. We know our future customers, we're talking to them right from the outset, we're not building speculatively, but it also means that we can innovate a bit more because we're, those future customers are part of our um, discussions in planning term, uh, design terms. And we think we get better design outcomes and, and better placemaking from that early engagement that's very real um, and that helps shift kind of um, ownership really early on for what you're creating. It's not to say it's um, easy for planners to respond to that, but it, it, because we're, it inevitably means slightly different things come out of it but that's that's why we're doing it we're, the, we're really clear that we think it's really beneficial um for us as a developer not just the future residents um if we go on and so we design it we sort of uh, this is conceptually how it works of course it's a bit more messy in practice but we, we separate it into sort of the key themes we've got the outline planning permission which we're doing first to get agreement in principle and then we're going into the detailed design process with the group we go on. And I've talked about the purchase journey and we're really mirroring that co-housing journey with a joining fee and a commitment fee and a formal reservation fee at the key stages and then into exchange of contract and final payment. So we haven't done anything particularly complex here. Okay. Next one. So this is, um, I think, probably the last slide, but this is, um, or maybe there's one more, but this is really just to reflect on where we think um, co-housing might be heading 
So there will still be group led uh, co-housing as we've had for the last 20 years. Um, and some of those might involve a developer like town acting as development manager. So that's, um, so we see that is one route through it. And in that context, we see the group providing the equity through to construction finance and then probably them looking for the land as well. You know, so we're coming in, they've sort of secured land or close to securing land. And we're, our expectation is really that they're going to self-fund through to that stage uh, when they need construction finance and we'll help them with that as development manager. So that's one model that I think there may be a growth of. Um, I have to say that in, in the UK, most groups will will resist working with a developer for as long as they possibly can. Um, and partly because our model, again, in the UK is that um, if the developer does the project, then they sell the homes at cost. And that there's a, maybe an assumption that therefore they get... Um, um, more for their money or cheaper homes than if they went with a developer because obviously they're going to have to pay a developer a fee and a margin at the end of it. I'm not sure that's true in reality. Um, and my son's now lives in co-housing in a context where the group has been the developer and bought a cost, but it's actually probably more expensive than if we had been involved. Um, so, the, you know, costs get absorbed in different ways but the one that we see uh, has the most potential and we um have a, a number of contexts where this is beginning to happen um is this sort of wider strategic development context a uh, bigger district um where we've had an opportunity to um through probably through tender process, but not necessarily secure a site in a wider development. Um, and we're seeing that happening now. And that's very much in the context of big new developments, thinking about placemaking, think about thinking about the value co-housing co might have in that context. So I'm going to come, my last slide is about that, but that this this model where we're we're the developer, we're leading it through. So we, we're securing the site, we're recruiting the potential co-housing members, helping them with the formation of the group, acting as the developer through the process, um, using our resources to recruit, using the network's resources to the uh, recruit, using other co-housing gr groups, networks to recruit and paying them for using that. Um, all of those methodologies to do that. Um, Recently, we've got an opportunity for a site, new build, 10,000 home development, sort of maybe a tenth of the way through. Um, and it's had a lot of critique for really poor um, placemaking and community spaces. We've gone this process. So we're, we're pre-tender and we've got 120 people on our uh, interested list. And we've done an um, initial survey which is really useful for our bidding. So we understand their needs. We can we can start even at that really early stage to think about the design and the unit mix in that context. And last week we had a webinar, still pre-tender, uh, to just talk with everybody about where we got to on the design and our thinking and where we are. And again, um, surveying them afterwards to keep, even at that early stage, to feed that into the process. So that's where we think in broad terms, uh, from a developer perspective, co-housing might happen in the UK and might happen at a greater pace than we've had before. And if I go to the last slide here, so this is um, a district in Cambridge that I'm involved in as a developer on the community engagement, 5,600 homes I mentioned it before, but um, making the case for co-housing in that context, this is some of the sort of arguments around that. Um, one is that it diversifies the product and the market. Actually, um, um, in really simplistic terms, people might consider living in a new development when they would never ordinarily do so in the context of co-housing. And now our sort of survey evidence supports that, um, that assertion. I, we probably have longer term, more committed in residence, uh, all of that sort of agency and control that comes with co-housing. Uh, the wider social environmental benefits that might come from that that sort of um, commitment. 
design quality, same thing we've talked about. Uh, the reputational impact of having co-housing as part of your mix, I think uh, people can look to that um, from examples in the UK. But the last one is important too, that commercially it makes sense that if you do co-housing early, you've got different stories, different market, um, you're probably getting higher values for those homes um, at the beginning of that development journey. There may be some potential to use the common house early on as a bit of a community facility, to be navigated how you do that that then becomes purely the co-housing facility later so but filling in the holes in the development journey um so this is the case we're increasingly making with some success um and um so i offer it to you really in that context and it makes sense as this part senses are also about for some sites it's about how do they do the self and custom build and maybe co-housing is a solution to that and that then enables the site to be sold with those constraints in a tender process that we're more likely to be able to compete with than um, any other kind of development site, site context right that's it that's my <laughs> overview of it so we're thank now, you francis I'm conscious we've taken long but we have paused on the way now we have had some questions which is good um yeah thank you very much that's i mean very generous to share your insights on, on, I suppose, where things are heading from your perspective in the UK generally. I mean, there's so many parallels to Australia. Um, yeah, so thank you. Well, I'm, look, we've got 10 minutes and, yep. uh, it's, you know, just before dinner time here in Australia, although, Francis, you've probably had your breakfast. If yep. you <laughs> happy to stay on for maybe another five, 10 minutes afterwards, depending on questions, that would be great. Yeah. Um, but um, look, I might sort of roll it to the to the attendees to ask any questions. I don't know, Richard. Is there any questions that have popped up in the chat? Oh, this has been responded to along the way. Yeah, by sure. The group. Uh, probably the the one question was about uh, maybe the was there rental in oh, Marmalade yeah. Lane? Uh, no, so ours is all market sale, and and I know our context will be different around sort of rental and affordable um, models, but it is the one area where I think co-housing groups really want to be very inclusive and respond to that housing crisis and be able to offer more affordable, and often our planning requirements require a percentage of that. Um, but I, not all of those statutory affordable models here would work well with co-housing and i think it's the you know the bit i focused on intentionality is really important and the the ability to manage your own community collectively and so for here some of those models would um people would just be at the top of the housing list and they would end up here um mm. so equipment isn't there or or those models the same context as australia Francis. Yeah, or they have a housing association. So there are a few models which don't involve a housing association and probably still enable you to have some intentionality. Here we've got um, discounted values for first time buyers that where the discount is in perpetuity. That's a bit better. Um, um, but it's it's a challenge, really, because it's uh, we went for a period of time where the whole movement in the UK set, sort of said we can do anything we're we can have in all those 10 years and at one level yes of course but i i personally am doubtful about it and within town where we take quite a cautious approach about it um i think just because we don't want to create undermine the kind of essence of what we're trying to create which is an intentional community um okay and then just with regard to the communal facilities at marmalade lane was there were there any compromises in terms of the design of the individual dwellings where amenity might have been offset by the communal facilities in terms of the statutory planning? No, I mean, we said we have um, national minimum standards for space spaces. Um, so we meet those and we didn't try and push those boundaries. Um, the homes are possibly smaller than might be built elsewhere. I don't know, I don't think so because increasingly people are building to the standards. Um, so, and there is interest in the UK in, in um, groups kind of 
having smaller homes and larger facilities, but those national space standards have acted as a, a restraint on that, I think. Well, yeah. I mean, that's been a focus for us in terms yeah. of trying to create the balance, the act between the the modesty of the homes and then the values of the homes from a development standpoint. So yeah. yeah. Have, to I mean, stand, I have to stand on their own, don't they, really? They do. So our homes are quite modest i mean in the uk anecdotally i think the our experience is that homes are probably 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent more than homes in the surrounding area some of that is the extra facilities and co-housing but some of that is just the homes are better quality and that very often land is in the co-housing gets access to in the uk is in poor quality area um, and to just exemplify that, I talked a little bit about local authorities and this sort of either wanting a good land receipt or wanting it uh, to use their land for sort of um, affordable homes. Um, the other problem that they have is even if they're committed to community led housing, that they often um, designate sites for community led housing, which co-housing is a sort of subset. Um, what they offer is land that is they can't dispose of it in any other way or they can't develop it themselves. So they're the most tricky sites that you could possibly find that a developer is going to find really difficult. And then they offer it to community-led housing, which, you know, how many more hurdles do you want to give? I can um, see that Sarah's yeah, oh, got sorry, a... Theresa, sorry, Theresa, um, we'll come back to you. Um, Sarah's got a question. She's oh, got... that's what I was saying. I was just saying Sarah's oh, got a And then please... Um, I was just wondering, thank you. It's been really interesting and insightful. It looks like you end up with a product that is really beautiful and people want to be a part of. Has that affected the affordability in the um, – so what we've seen here with some of them is, you know, once they've been done and been proved that it, you can you can do it, that the cost goes up because other people want to do it too. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any covenant or anything over – the to to keep them affordable and whether the land um owners can just sell at at will or if there's any agreement around terms of so that. I think that so many of the um other co-housing communities were essentially sold at cost to the residents um because they were the developer and that made obviously made sense and so and they didn't protect it so you know on later sale they definitely have picked up the benefit of that if they were able to build at cost but you know within the market and um uh co-housing here typically has some kind of restriction around resale uh to just enable the group to sell within its own network initially if it can so here we have an eight week period in which we can do that. We don't need to sell our homes off market. We've got a waiting list of 300 people. Um, we've started to sell off market. It hasn't been the scary thing that we thought it might be. And it's purely to do with um, mortgage valuations. Um, the va valuers found it very hard to value something that was just sold off market all the time. So we've been trying to address that. Um, and and as consequence, it's also hard for us to value or estate agents to value as well the home. So actually, we sort of unintentionally restricted the values initially while we were selling off market. Lacey, do you want to? And this kind of flows on a bit, I guess, from that response. Um, I, so I live at Murundaka out here and I'm also part of Broome Street. And um, one thing that I've noticed from both projects is getting new residents. And I'm wondering what challenges have you found with getting new residents or community members? Um, sounds like you've got a huge list and so maybe this isn't a thing for you, but um, were there challenges and how did you go about getting over them? Because living in co-housing is a very specific lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. And it does, as you know, it doesn't always work for people. So we get quite a high turnover uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, I think one of the things we've observed in the UK is that if any co-housing group has publicity, um, and they do because they're so rare still, that everybody receives inquiries. Um, mm. And and so kind of, and because it's still so unknown, all publicity is good publicity <laughs> in a way that we, in people terms of finding people. Um, uh, and we've had, uh, like we had a, 
TikTok influencer come to stay and they they did um, some stuff for us and uh, we suddenly had a younger generation. Our challenge actually is reaching a younger generation. Um, the typical um, interest from co-housing comes from someone like me who's in there. Generally, a woman in their 50s is going to be driving that commercial, uh, that, that sort of interest in that very typically. So we have very high numbers of people who are 50 plus, who are interested in one or two bed apartment uh, properties, who want to be in a multi-generational context uh, and we don't have the families. And so that's the challenge for us in um, co-design processes is we start the journey very skewed. <laughs> um, and how do we address that? And that's a, that's a challenge that we're now starting to really think about. Um, and we're also starting to think about, do we create on larger sites, do we create multiple co-housing? like so maybe two or three co-housing communities all are joining having some shared facilities and some individual facilities are all with different flavors so and that's partly because of sometimes the sites come uh, that are available in a big master plan are just too big for one community and we're not going to persuade the developer to do a little disposal so we're kind of think actually can we do it differently is the demand is there enough demand to do it differently so we're just on the cusp really of thinking that through so you don't have any because we found the same thing younger younger people are it's you know it's a challenge to get them in especially with income and savings and stuff for small younger families you don't have any specific you have any advice no, <laughs> no, the exactly. you're going around I, we obviously have a lot of children here 35 mm -hmm. a lot of being born here um and we were really, I can remember us being really worried about where are the families, where are the families. And every open event, we wheeled out the one family. Um, and actually, it's been a lot about word of mouth. Uh, I think our experience is the families come a bit later in the journey, typically. Um, so you kind of have to, and a lot came after it was completed. Um, and um, actually advertising, going for a normal estate agent, reached some of those people as well. There was a lot of word of mouth of existing families um, and they tended to be local. They didn't, the families didn't tend to move from all across the country, whereas the older generation just moved <laughs> for co-housing. Uh, you, you have to say very local. Uh, the affordability, I mean, the reality here is uh, Cambridge is quite an affluent city. So whilst I think we were very concerned about affordability, we have young families moving in who don't even need a mortgage. Um, so it's not uh, it's not accessible, but there is enough demand here. Great. Thanks so much. I would also just add, I became interested in co-housing in my late 20s, but that was over a decade ago. So if you are young and know how to use TikTok and Instagram, please contact me. Yes. I'm not young, but I do know how to use TikTok and Instagram. Mm. Good, en good enough. Fern, <laughs> uh, did you have a question? Yeah, no, Frances kind of answered it because I, was, I know that we had a chat with, with her when we were there and she did say that the younger families came later, you know, after the development because oh. they just haven't got the equity to, to make it happen. And we're experiencing something similar. But um, yeah, just, just to say if anybody on this presentation is interested in co-housing, Braum Street are looking for members. Yeah, we've got 15 of our units that are taken. We need another five participants. So yeah, give us a shot. I would like really lovely people as absolutely. well. <laughs> and I think that so the equity point is just a slightly different point. The barrier wasn't here here, wasn't equity. Uh, I think it was just hearing about it and also like thinking ahead. So my son, as I've said, has just moved into co-housing uh, up in the north of England. And I told him about that site when it first was acquired by co-housing and he didn't pay any attention to me at all. And he wasn't ready to think about that. Um, I think he did actually have a relationship at the time. But, you know, since then, the relationship has firmed up. They managed to save. They got fed up with the rental market. We started to think about having a family. Um, and... So they kind of came back to that co-housing context too late to secure a discount. <laughs> but, you know, so, but they arrived in that journey and then they got in sort of the, the group as a developer and they were just overwhelmed by the amount of work involved and very much had to side back seat while others did, did that because they just couldn't cope. And then moved in and, and the baby arrived um, actually before they managed to move in. Um, so, you know, and... and 
he definitely could have been part of the journey. It just they, they didn't have the headspace to be there. Good one. All right, well, we're a little bit past seven. Is there any other final questions? I'm going to take one more question. Um, but while, perhaps while people are thinking about whether they want to ask a question, um, Elena might want to plug Westside Co-House <laughs> after Sam's brilliant Brom Street plug. Um, yeah, ter terrible at self-promotion as yeah. always. Yeah, we've got another co-housing project in the inner west of Melbourne. I've put a link to our, currently we just have a Facebook page, um, but a website coming soon. And I've also put a link to Newco because I always promote other people before I promote myself there in Newcastle. Um, they're underway and yeah certainly reach out to co-housing australia to find out about other projects maybe happening near you or if there's not one happening near you maybe you are the first person to come to the party and i think i said to tim that i was very happy to organize another one which was more about that might be more useful for you in terms of recruiting people that is more about living in co-housing and perhaps we can find a family to come and talk about that too so um if it's that'd helpful be great. yeah that'd be great yeah i did think that um it'd be good to for the brown street group to be able to speak to francis and also west side just around just that experience of living in community now that that um mama lane's been uh, five years is it? four years four years yeah five years i would also just add that um if you're if you're here because you're a councillor or a town planner, then also please reach out to us, to me or to Teresa, who's our uh, planning policy working group convener. If any of the things that you've seen tonight have inspired you and you really want to help more co-housing projects happen, please join us in kind of bringing that to your municipality or to working with us to help all municipalities develop better planning processes to facilitate more of these projects because in Australia we definitely have a challenge with horizontal sprawl and vertical sprawl and we really need to get better at doing the missing middle and I think co-housing is a really kind of interesting and and sort of easy way to demonstrate good design outcomes but also social benefit so if we can socialize that more in the Australian context I think we can really help shift the narrative about medium density. Sarah? I was just going to say in, in, in terms of doing that, if you do have, you know, obviously we have state-based, I am a counsellor, and we have state-based, uh, what's it called, local government conferences where we can pass resolutions to help enable um, so if you have anything like that from Victoria that I could take to New South Wales or or anything we could work on, um, I'd be really, really happy to to try and um, fast track something to help get those mechanisms because we just come up, up against red tape at every hurdle. Um, and, I, 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 yeah, I would love to try and streamline that. And especially with the discussion that's going on around the um, housing crisis and everything else, you know, you can get a bit more traction than you can at other times. Yeah, it does feel like it's a bit of a perfect storm for doing things differently at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thanks so can much. I just ask Sarah which council you're in? I'm the Deputy Mayor of Byron Shire. I can I can connect you guys actually after this if you like. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Oh, hang on, one last question. Ivia, we got in just at the right time. Did you mean to raise your hand, Divya? Maybe not. No, okay. <laughs> but can I just quickly add in, Tim, when, yep. when I was there, they, were, they got a lovely uh, calendar on the wall, um, a big calendar with all the activities. And just to add, add the cherry on the top, um, they've got beer making workshops that they do every night again at Marmalade Lane. So how is that for a good, a good thing to get involved in? <laughs> All right. Well, good, uh, good one, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francis, for joining us from K 
Cambridge. And um, yeah, look, we've recorded this. So look, I'll upload it to YouTube and um, uh, share it with everybody who's, who's booked in. So you get a copy of it. And um, yeah, thanks again, Francis. Really You're very good. welcome. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 B